Hi folks, uh, this is Jason, hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you and giving a public lecture on miracles, are they reasonable? And um, I hope that this is going to be a help to you to think through this issue. And so let's come before the Lord. Father, we confess our failure and sin. We acknowledge our need of you, Lord, and we pray for forgiveness and cleansing. And Father, we pray that you be with us now and bless us, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. The history of the debate on miracles, origin in 185 to 254, and Justin Martyr saw miracles as a good proof of Christianity. Athanasius and Gregory of Nicaea thought miracles were. In the Middle Ages, Aquinas believed that any action done by an infinite being must be miraculous. In the form Reformation, Luther saw the cross as the greatest miracle of all and assigned limited value to miracles as such. Calvin clearly taught that miracles were a proof of the gospel, but from origin to Calvin, no one believed miracles were proof of God's existence. In the 1600s, skepticism was on the increase. Descartes made miracles doubtful as, it, as he made reality a rational coordinate system. Pascal, the French mathematician, saw that reality cannot be understood unless God was the final reference point. Reason alone, he thought, could not prove anything. In Britain, the empiricist put an emphasis on experience. The scientists saw the laws of science as the laws of God. The universe to them was like a watch which had been left to unwind. This gave the idea that nature was left on her own. Spinoza thought nature was God. He used evangelistic, Calvinistic language to teach pantheism. He believed that all the miraculous events in the Bible were due to natural laws. Hobbes used Calvinistic language but was really a rationalist. He questioned the testimony of miracles as doubtful and Locke saw miracles as God's credentials for God's spokesperson. The deists were sceptical about miracles and they believed in rational religion and free speech. They were critical of the Bible and church. The Orthodox Christians defended their position and Bishop Butler argued that miracles could have taken place on the grounds of probability. Middleton, who was a Christian but wanting to attack Catholicism, wrote a massive history of miracles and concluded they should not be taken seriously. Gibson, Gibbon, the secular historian, explain Christianity in terms of the natural laws of history. You quote the uniformity of experience. His views of causality meant we don't even know what unifies one event, let alone explain a miracle. In the 16th century, Kant's philosophy ruled supreme. He did not argue against miracles, but dismissed them. Ramirez cast doubt on the testing of miracles in the New Testament, and Lessing said there are no historical proofs that could verify a miracle. Schleiermacher played down miracles, and we have a better understanding than the disciples had, he said. Strauss saw nature and God as one, so his pantheism made miracles redundant. Kierkegaard believed that divinity is something hidden and, it, and is incapable of being seen directly with the senses or reduced to the logical conclusion of reason. In modern times, the doubts continued. Anthony flew to Hume's position, but less dogmatically. Professor Smart did miracles were nothing but random events and Richard Swinburne argued that there is higher probability miracles happened and he says this from his idea that slender historical evidence is valid. Ramsey believed miracles are not a scientific question. Malcolm D. Diamond believed it is logical to give a supernaturalist interpretation of miracles but intellectually the cost was too great. The reform scholars like Giesler and defend miracles from the validity of historical evidence and miracles as proof of God. Some of the best contributions to the debate have come from pens of the following writers. The great Catholic theologian Louis Monden saw miracles as sacramental signs which pointed to the incarnational and the eschatological hope. C.S. Lewis was the defender of miracles and he believed that miracles were not a violation of nature and should be seen in their incarnational context. The neo-orthodox theologians Bruner and Barth made their contributions. Bruner believed miracles were an embarrassment to modern man and should be seen as signs in the study of Jesus. Barth ignored any apologetics and believed miracles was a sign of God. Learn these three lessons from this history. One, 
is the church generally believed in miracles but did not see them as proofs for God. Two, that skepticism grew stronger and stronger through each century. Three, the modern thinkers prefer to play down miracles generally and the apologetic fence of miracles and to see them as signs in relation to the incarnation. Next, in defense of miracles. Norman Geisler has been one of the main scholars defending miracles as a proof for God. He makes the point not only supernaturalism can take into account extraordinary events, he thinks by definition all events are precluded in a theistic explanation. He then criticizes Hume. Giesler believes that manuscript evidence for the New Testament is the best of any ancient text. This gives it miracles and historical base. Also, the time gap between the recorded events and their event is smaller than any ancient manuscript. These manuscripts are written by eyewitness accounts. He uses Kant's reality. Then he turns to the resurrection as the greatest proof for miracles. It confirmed by eyewitness accounts and any contradiction of the event are an authentication of its truth. 1 Corinthians 15:6. John 20, 11, 18, show us that these witnesses were many and of high moral character as they were willing to die for their faith. Giesler's position is summarized as 1. That miracles are identifiable in a theistic universe. 2. That the Bible provides a framework to identify miracles. and 3. That the greatest proof for miracles is the resurrection. He then finishes by challenging the reader to realize that naturalism cannot meet a person's need. The problem uh, with Giesler arises as follows, even if you accept the New Testament documents are very accurate, does it prove miracles happen? Giesler puts a lot of hope on the witnesses to the resurrection. Giesler also fails to grapple with Hume's contention that each religion is cancelled out by the content of the miracles. Noah Smith has stated that this is a very strong argument. In the first place, every religion has its own stock of miracles, some of which are as well attested as the Christian miracles. Would Mr. Hume deny that these miracles occurred? And if he does, must it not be from the arbitrary standpoint such as he himself condemns? If he is willing to accept them, must there not be some flaw in the argument by which the devotees of other religions prove the existence of their God from such evidence? And might not the flaw appear also in the Christian case? Or are we to accept that the God of, a of Muhammad and the whole Greek and Hindu pantheists? The other defender of miracles is C.S. Lewis. He makes the distinction between the natural and the supernatural. For him, it's precisely because modern New Testament scholarship has ruled out the supernatural that it is biased in seeing any other view. He makes the point. They thus make it part of their method to eliminate the supernatural whenever it is even remotely possible to do so, to strain natural explanation even to the merely suggestion of a miracle. And this really, end of quote, is this really true? The historian deliberately destroys the supernatural view which leaves no room for miracles. Are historians as dogmatic as C.S. Lewis thinks? Are they revising, do they revise their ideas? Another protagonist for miracles is Houston. He believes he has good epistemological reasons uh, for this. His criticism, crit he criticizes foundational epistemology but still be believes miracles can be looked at. They are possible, and he begins to suggest a few ways that these might be verified. Miracles must accord with inductive consistency. They must relate to the whole. He points out that if science can't explain an event, it leaves room for theism to explain it. This is the fundamental idea. This seems like a God of the gaps theology. We can't explain it, so it must be God. It's not, in my opinion, a violation. It is anti-foundationalist epistemology means his use of language is metaphor, this means all he is really doing is defending miracles as a possibility and is really playing around with metaphor. It might represent reality, it might not, who knows. Conclusion, Geisler's position sets science and religion in a dogfight. Science is the great demon and we must slay it with some, some of our own weapons, that's facts. What facts will prove the case? The facts he uses are the New Testament documents. Does this work? for those for, to think through that. Fact, facts come through biased. Uh, having said that, so does the bias of the skeptic. C.S. Lewis sets his historian in a demonic way. They are evil ones with anti-supernatural bias who are stripping away the New Testament of miracles. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as saying that historians are demonic, but I would go far as to say every historian does have such an attitude 
to demonise doesn't allow for a proper debate. But as to, but I do think that presuppositions of historians do need to be challenged, and I think C.S. Lewis is correct at that. Houston is very sophisticated and versatile thinker. He uses realistic epistemology to give miracles a human today. The problem of basing your argument in epistemology is it's a bottomless pit. Once you use metaphor to describe reality, it is then difficult to know where reality ends and metaphor begins. Um, just putting that there, what I mean is uh, you can have metaphor describing reality but is not actual reality. In other words, you don't really know if reality is there and you're using metaphor. But there is a difference between metaphor and ontological reality, a reality that is there ontologically speaking. Next, against miracles. One of the great minds to speak against miracles is David Hume. He advocated knowledge through science. He believed there were no innate ideas. He believed you can't know the cause of anything. He thought that to include God from science was correct to such ideas within the science. His skepticism of knowledge then flows into miracles. Quote, the plain consequence is that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavours to establish and even in that case there is a mutual destruction of arguments and the superior only gives to an assurance suitable to the degree of force which remains after deducing the inferior. End of quote. Hume's criticism against miracles was really an attack against bigotry. He wanted to put a check on religious enthusiasm. Reason was the only tool for debate, but it was experience he used. Uh, exclamation mark. The experience of, huma of common humanity outweighed the experience of those who say they have seen isolated miracles. History could not be used, as far as he was concerned, to this to contradict the uniformity of experience. Hume's whole position is based on the scepticism of human knowledge. His system not only doubts metaphysics, but also science. If Hume used his methodology on himself, then it would destroy his position. He is saying, I know that we don't know anything, but perhaps what he should say is, I know we don't know anything, which means I don't know anything. Hume's position is not an argument, but a worldview. He does not believe in anything. So on, so on one side, he rejects religion, but on the other side, writes books on philosophy and history, pretending to, that to the world he knows a lot, but his system denies it. What we see then is that Hume's philosophy colors his conclusions. A more modern position that has been taken is to see miracles as signs. These believe these writers believe miracles can be seen in process and tradition of seeing them as proofs. To such writers as Tillich and N.T. Wright, Tillich flatly refuses to accept the old definition of what a miracle is. Quote, if you define a miracle like this, then I would simply say that this is a demonic distortion of the meaning of miracle in the New Testament and it is distorted because it means that God has to destroy his creation in order to produce his solution. I call this demonic because God is then split in himself and, in, in, and is unable to express himself through his creative power." End of quote. Um, melodramatic from Tillich there, don't you think? N.T. Wright explains his view in the new, now popular today. Few serious historians quote, quote Few historians now deny that Jesus, and for that matter, any other people performed cues and did other startling things for which there was no obvious natural explanation. But Christian apologists have moved on as well. Miracles are not advanced as written far more is intention and meaning. End of quote. There has been a long tradition which is still being used which defends miracles as proof. Is it right to sweep away such a long and noble tradition? Our meaning and intention to meet the same thing. Surely the quality of an action is of supreme importance. If I hit someone over the head with a hammer and kill that person, then my friend in court lies and says I did not kill the dead victim. Are these actions of no significance? Meaning and intention are of great importance, but we also need to know the quality of an action. When we say a miracle is a sign, we are giving it a quality. This is denied by right and others. When we say a miracle is a sign, we are giving it a quality. This is denied by right and others. What I mean is that a miracle happened ontologically. It's not just 
functionally, but we have to talk about it ontologically at its source, at its root, at its being. And that's what N.T. Wright and others are not doing. Conclusion. I do not agree with Hume and his criticism of miracles. He is a consistent skeptic. He applies his skepticism with ruthlessness on Christianity, but he fails to do the same in his philosophical and historical writing. I do not agree with the scholars Tillich and Wright that miracles are signs and intentions, and that's all that matters. Not the way they state it. They want to avoid the issue of actually defining the essence or ontological significance of a miracle. If they did this, it might give them more data to construct a view of miracles. Final conclusion. Are miracles reasonable? It depends on which context you look at it. If you look at it from an orthodox Christian position, then miracles are reasonable. Are, are, quite, are quite extensive, for example, in the area of the resurrection. But these facts, these historical facts, are coloured by a particular way of understanding those facts. And if that particular way of understanding those facts can be verified or given evidence for them, i.e. that there is a God, or that there is a possibility of the supernatural, then if evidence is presented that for example, Jesus rose from the dead, then it would be perfectly reasonable. If our modern skeptics, the modern skeptics of Hume and postmodern age, regard things cannot be proved historically. Does this destroy miracles? No, it means the skeptic cannot prove that miracles do not happen. They might happen, they might not. Nobody knows from a skeptical point of view, so it's reasonable for the postmodernists to be open minded velocity of miracles. But if we study the Bible we see a different context. We see a much richer understanding of miracles. If we look at uh, Exodus chapter 4, Moses was commissioned by God with a miracle. In Exodus 7:18, 7, 7, chapter 7 verse 8 to 12, miracles are used to show God's redemptive purpose. Israel was to, to always remember her miraculous deliverance from Egypt. 3, a miracle for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego convinced a pagan king to worship the one true God and declare God before the known world, Daniel 3.38. In Matthew 4.3, miracles can be a means of temptation, as Satan tempted Jesus with one. And five, Jesus used miracles to show he had the power over sin. In the context of the Bible, we see a mixture of complex models all intertwined, making miracles as signs of God's redemptive purpose, as instruments of evil sometimes, and as demonstration of God's working in history. This is the way the Bible sees miracles. From the Bible's point of view, they reveal a living God working in history. This is close to N.T. Wright and Tillich's ideas, but it does give more of an apologetic nature to miracles as it's very, and has some similarities between Bart. The point is this, is if you study the Bible, it's much richer in its understanding of miracles than even orthodox presentations or modern presentations or skeptical presentations of the issue of the debate. The, the, the actual Bible's teaching on miracles is much more rich and nuanced and complex and simple than modern representatives of what a miracle is and also the skeptical representation of what a miracle is. And it's on the basis of what the Bible teaches and its understanding of what a miracle is and how it presents miracles, it would be reasonable. We would have to go into a much more extensive study of these miracles to be able to present that case just gone over the historical and theoretical ground of the subject and I hope that was of interest to you. My references for this lecture are C. Brown, Miracles and the Critical Mind, uh, Paternoster, London, 1984, Anthony Flew, Hume's Philosophy of Belief, Routledge, London, 1961, N. Geisler, Miracles and Modern Thought, Zonder and Grand Rapids, 1982, Reported Miracles, Cambridge University Press, Cambridge, 1996, Houston, J. Houston, A. Kenny, the Great Philosophers, B. Books, London, 1987, C. Lewis, C.S. Lewis, Miracles, the Centri Centri Centenary Press, London, 1947, D. McNabb, The Concise Encyclopedia of Western Philosophy and Philosophers, Unwin, London, 1989, B. Russell, A History of Western Philosophy, George Allen, London, 1946, N. Smith, The Atonement, S.E.M. Press, London, 1968, P. Tiller, 
London 1965, C. Webb, A History of Philosophy, Oxford University Press, London 1964, and N.T. Wright, Jesus and the Victory of God, SBCK, London 1996. My recommended resource and book for this uh, lecture that you could go and read and research would be, well, two pieces of information. Number one, the PhD of Gary Habermas on the resurrection. The PhD of Gary Habermas on the resurrection. And then finally, uh, the book on miracles by Craig Keener. Miracles by Craig Keener. These are res resources that I recommend you go and study on the subject. Thank you for listening and God bless you.